the the Fed can't solve the problem that we have. So you're not you can't solve the the problem of uh, 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 rates rising back up to normal levels through printing money. You can't solve the problem of increased uh, support ratios. You know that 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 worker fewer workers are supporting more retirees you can't solve that by printing up some you know lowering interest rates or quantitative easing um welcome to wealthy on i'm wealthy on founder adam taggart after one of the most bruising years for markets in recent memory the outlook from here remains highly uncertain so how are the big players, those managing tens of billions of dollars in client capital, allocating their portfolios right now? And what may the regular retail investor learn from their strategy? To find out, we're fortunate to welcome back Chris Brightman to the program today. Chris is the CEO and CIO of Research Affiliates, and along with Rob Arnett, is co-portfolio manager on the PIMCO All Asset and All Asset All Authority Funds and the PIMCO RAE Funds. To give you a sense of the impressive scope of Chris's work, around $150 billion in assets are managed worldwide using investment strategies developed by research affiliates. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Um, Chris, so excited to have you back. Um, a number of the statements you made the last time you were on the program um, proved to come true in spades in the several months following. Um, so I, I really want to give you credit for that, but dig into those in just a second. Before I do, though, let's just start this conversation at the high level. I like to start all these interviews on. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? To use uh, a uh, weather analogy, uh, given that we're uh, in California, uh, uh, I, I would describe the economic and political outlook as stormy. Stormy. Um, during 2022, poor policy choices exacerbated by the war in Ukraine caused a global inflation crisis. Uh, specifically, when I refer to poor policy choices, uh, uh, I, I, I see nationalist protectionism, uh, xenophobic restrictions on immigration and heavy-handed pandemic lockdowns as uh, having uh, reduced aggregate supply and extraordinary fiscal stimulus um, uh, paired with easy money um, and reactionary inflation targeting, meaning you wait uh, to raise interest rates until after you've seen inflation jump up. Um, caused, uh, as we all know now, uh, inflation to rise to levels that we last saw in the uh, early 1980s. And uh, as a direct result, uh, interest rates and risk premiums jumped and capital market prices uh, uh, tumbled. Now, um, even though inflation appears to have peaked last year, uh, it remains elevated. Uh, there's lots of different ways to look at inflation, uh, but but no matter how you look at it, it, it remains a problem. Uh, if we look at the uh, month of January 2023 compared to a year earlier, uh, the core PCE deflator, uh, the Fed's uh, sort of uh, preferred measure of inflation, increased by five, core CPI by six, sticky CPI by seven, and median CPI by eight. So depending upon how you want to look at it, year over year inflation is running between five and eight percent. Um, and because unemployment remains uh, extraordinarily low at 3.4 percent and job growth strong, uh, the Fed will continue hiking uh, rates in the months ahead. Uh, uh, when short rates will peak and at what level remains uncertain. We've never been in an exactly this circumstance before, so nobody knows, uh, but but I think it's just uh, uh, quite obvious that uh, rates will continue to rise. Uh, and, uh, you know, Today, the yield curve is inverted uh, by greater than a full percentage point with T-bill yields above five and long bond yields below four. Uh, the impact on growth and unemployment uh, of the recent tightening of monetary and fiscal policies uh, will arrive with a lag of many quarters to a couple of years. And so even as uh, China reopening provides a bit of a boost to growth in the first half of this year, a recession later in this year or next uh, still seems more likely than not. Um, 
moving from uh, the economic environment, uh, again, I described that as pretty stormy, uh, uh, Fans of uh, political drama may look forward to uh, ample entertainment in the the upcoming <laughs> seasons. Uh, this summer uh, promises yet another installment of the uh, debt ceiling farce, and uh, uh, next year uh, we have the prospect of a rematch between Trump and Biden, with the Biden administration suffering through a uh, recession and rising unemployment and uh, uh, Trump under indictment. Um, uh, but what really worries me is not that kind of manufactured uh, 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 made for TV political drama, but the uh, growing and what I fear un is unhealthy political consensus in the US for increased protectionism, uh, reduced uh, immigration, and a complete disregard for unsustainable growth in sovereign debt. All right. Um, wow. That was um, a very detailed yet still very concise punch card of um, a whole bunch of really important issues coming uh, that we're dealing with. I did a really good job of putting a lot in, into a relatively short answer. Um, all right. So Stormy, um, I think I want to dive into all of your major points that you just made there, Chris. Um, first, though, let me, because um, it's related, let me give you full props for um, two statements you made when you were on here uh, back in October, I think last. Um, you said the markets are underestimating how stubborn inflation is gonna be to tame. Um, well, you just rattled off you know, the, the stats that basically show that that is the case here. Um, you also said as for interest rates, you think they'll need to go to a minimum of 5%. All right, tick, You know, we're pretty much on our way there right now with the next couple of hikes that Powell's gonna make. Um, you said they could easily go up to 7%. Um, I'm curious, uh, you did say that you see, for all the reasons you mentioned, the Fed continuing to hike from here. Do you still think that like a Fed's fund rate of like 7% is still in the realm of possibility here? Um, inflation is moderating. And I think it will likely continue to moderate uh in the months ahead uh however um i don't think we've tightened policy enough look uh it, it, 5% uh, short rates uh only match the most optimistic observations of inflation now I, I do think inflation will come down inflation will come down to 4% maybe to 3% but uh you know, with the humility that nobody's ever seen this before. And so, you know, there's considerable error band and, you know, any estimate I have. Absolutely. But I think the probability is is higher than people expect that we do not get down to 2% for many, many years. And so, yeah, I think the Fed's going to have to, uh, uh, it's probably going to stop, pause, my guess is you're not going to see much uh, in the way of interest rate increases, if any, in 2024, a political season. Uh, and as a result, we won't uh, have fixed the inflation problem. And then the Fed is going to go back and it's going to be even more difficult. Uh, and yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's easy to imagine uh, 7 percent uh, rates. But that's probably when the Fed has to, you know, uh, uh, resume tightening after it failed to achieve the 2% inflation objective. Uh, the other thing, and uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not sharing anything that your, your, your listeners uh, can't uh, uh, read uh, for themselves, but you expect even more discussion than we're seeing now of uh, revising the Fed's target inflation mm -hmm. rate from two to uh, uh, up to three uh, so that they, uh, well, just because um, uh, it's politically difficult to, uh, you know, really channel Paul Volcker and do what's necessary to get inflation back under control. Got it. So so they basically you, you, you see likelihood of a moving of the goalposts here. Right. Which is uh, well, whether they do or they don't, I think you're going to hear a lot more about it. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, 
Last time they made a mistake, I, I think it was a terrible mistake, was this average inflation targeting, this notion that we're not going to be forward looking. We're not going to, when we see all the signals of inflation rising, typically that's when you need to take the punch bowl away. This right. time they decide, no, nah, we'll just leave the punch bowl sitting there until everybody's well and truly drunk uh, uh, and then and then address it. Uh, that was that was a, a rather, you know, uh, unfortunate uh, uh attempt to move the goalposts without admitting you're moving the goalposts. I think that's probably what you're going to see uh, in the years ahead uh, if, and you know, it still has to be said that it's an if, uh, the Fed is not uh, successful getting inflation all the way back down to 2% uh, in this cycle. Um, uh, they will come up with some convoluted discussion of why their new approach allows a 3% inflation rate, even though their long-term target is 2 Okay. Um, let me just pound through a couple of, of, of questions related to this that have come up on this channel recently, just so we can fully square where you are. Um, if, if I understand what you've said so far, you think the Fed... Um, is still very much spooked by inflation. Um, they're going to keep hiking. Uh, at some point, they will pause. Uh, they will hold it for a good while. Um, and like you said, uh, they probably don't want to raise the closer we get to the election because there's going to be a lot of pressure on them not to, right? Especially especially since unemployment's going to be rising, right? I mean, I, I think that's a pretty good uh, 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 forecast. Look, we've got the yield curve inverted by you know over 100 basis points, and we know that monetary and fiscal policy has tightened a lot, and uh, uh, that operates with a multi-quarter, multi, even multi-year lag. So I think the probability is just you know, pretty darn high that we're going to have rising unemployment. You know, think of unemployment rising from 3.4 to, you know, five and a half in, in the middle of election season. It's really hard for the Fed to come in with uh, rapidly rising unemployment, even if, you know, five and a half or whatever it is, five, five and a half remains at most people's estimate of normal, you know, full employment rate. <laughs> the The trend is going to get all the news and uh, and it's going to be just enormously politically difficult for the Fed to uh, continue hiking uh, uh, in that environment. So, yeah, I think 2024 is going to be a pause. OK, so you're you're bringing a few things into this. I want to dig into you further here. Uh, but first, let me let me let me clarify the, the the first part of the story, which is the Fed at some point is going to say we've hiked as far as we dare for now. We're going to pause. We're going to see what happens. Uh, my sense from intuiting for what you're saying, the Fed is going to be looking at inflation maybe as almost sort of like a coal seam fire, right? Like, OK, we think we've got it under control, but it might be still smoldering below the surface here. So we don't want to revert back to looser policy yet to reinflame it, but we don't feel like we can keep tightening anymore because we've got the constraints that you were just talking about, right? So they're going to be potentially somewhat in a little bit of a box. Um, you're nodding as I'm saying this. So that that's more or less, okay, great. Um, so uh, there are some who fear, and, and I would just showing my cards, I'm a little bit in this camp, but totally willing to be wrong, which say that, look, the economy is going to have a really hard time um, with a Fed's fund at four and a half percent and and certainly at five and maybe at five and a half percent or whatever, just given how indebted the country is these days versus the last time the Fed was on a really big hiking inflation killing campaign. Um, and there's a lag effect. You've now mentioned that several times, right? So uh, some people say, that the Fed may be actually over tightening at this point and that anything from here, you know, is just going to make that recession you're afraid of even worse going forward. What do you say to those who argue the Fed maybe should be pausing now and just seeing, waiting to see what happens? Because it, it always, to a certain extent, within the constraints of the election, can retighten if it sees later on it did not do quite enough. Sure. I think this highlights a difference of opinion uh, that I have relative to uh, consensus uh, regarding, um, well, in a Fed jargon, our star, uh, uh, otherwise, you know, the uh, natural uh, level of real short term interest rates are sometimes called the uh, non inflation accelerating real short rate, you know, Nehru. Um, um, if you think that's zero, and many people do, I think the Fed thinks that's zero, 
uh, in the present uh, environment. Uh, ben Bernanke's, you know, probably the most uh, well-regarded and uh, a forceful uh, proponent of this uh, uh, R star of zero. Uh, then everything that you just said makes sense, right? You know, the, it, it's a lag. We're probably already neutral, if not uh, uh, a little bit restrictive. As the quarters progress, we'll just keeping interest rates at five will become increasingly restrictive as inflation gets down to four or three. Uh, uh, then, you know, it should go all the way down to uh, uh, Fed's target and, and then the next move would be Fed uh, loosening. But I don't believe that. I think that our star uh, was uh, 2% for, uh, oh, call it uh, uh, a few decades uh, um, uh, uh, during an incredible demographic sweet spot. Uh, of this huge shock of labor, uh, not just in China, but principally in China, coming into the global economy. And over the long sweep of history, uh, uh, real short rates normal, uh, normally are not zero. Zero uh, 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 real interest rates is not norm. It is not going to be the norm in the future. In fact, it's probably going to be uh, uh, rising rather considerably because we have fewer and fewer workers supporting a growing uh, uh, cohort of retirees. Mm -hmm. And that's going to put upward pressure on labor costs. Uh, that's going to come out of corporate profits. And it's going to rise, raise uh, uh, real interest rates. And normal real interest rates are more like 1% or 2%, maybe for a time as high as 3%. Uh, and uh, and so I think the Fed uh, is going to have to hike uh, considerably more uh, than um, would be implied if uh, the, the normal or or equilibrium real short term interest rate was zero. Um, uh, so uh, maybe it's just a non consensus view on that fundamental driver of uh, capital market pricing. Okay. Well, you know the Fed to a certain extent. Um, sh shares your opinion that it, it it should be going higher now. Well, it, it does because it says it's going to, <laughs> but also Powell has said, hey, look, if I over tighten, we know we've got the tools to deal with that, right? Um, may maybe that's hubris, maybe it isn't, maybe that's truly how the Fed thinks. Um, and certainly they, they do know how to flood the world with trillions if they think they have to, they've done it before. Um, but but Powell has basically said, look, if I'm going to err, I'm going to err on the side of over tightening. So it does seem maybe odds wise that that's that's what's likely to go on. Um, you, you make me want to your answer made me want to ask you this question, which is, you just said, hey, look, um, we are going to be in a um, a higher cost world going forward. I'll say for the foreseeable future. You can put any time constraint on it that you like, but basically um, for our uh, lifetimes. For the rest of our lifetimes. Okay, great. <laughs> then maybe you've just answered my question, right? Which is, you know, we're going to have a, a, a we're going to have higher real interest rates than we've we've had for a good while. Um, we're likely going to have a higher cost of capital than we've had for a long while. Like capital is probably not going probably not going to go back to zerp for a prolonged period of time the way that that we were for the past bunch of years. Um, and we're going to just have this this demographically driven higher labor costs and and if we are entering a world where there's you, you talked about some of the the geopolitical trends that are going on the shifting of trade and all that stuff and reshoring and all that stuff that's likely to to put pressure on input costs uh making them rise secularly going forward so it just seems to me that all of that is going to put a drag on economic growth going forward. I'm not going to say that we can't have a growing global economy, but it's probably just not going to grow with the fervor that a lot of us are used to. Um, well, certainly you... population growth is going to be lower uh, than it was. That's unarguable. Uh, um, productivity growth, is that going to be higher or lower? I think that's much more complicated. I, I, yeah, I, I agree with I, that. I have, no, I have no view as to whether uh, a productivity growth is going to be higher or lower, though... Um, 
you know, uh, we, we we really did have a growth problem in the 70s. And a, a, a good way to think about the growth problem that we had in the 70s was we prioritized other things. We prioritized, and it's just not necessarily wrong or a bad thing. We pro suddenly prioritized uh, 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 environment. Uh, uh, we, you know, the, the, the EPA came about and, and, and cleaned up air and water, you know, that doesn't show up in the productivity growth, but it's something I appreciate. Right. It's a return uh, that we all think is very positive. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, uh, uh, uh. Uh, there were, you know, there were other uh, social uh, uh, goals being uh, promoted and uh, uh, um, prioritized uh, that we all remember in the 1960s and 70s, uh, at least those of us who lived through it. Uh, and, you know, I think we're, we're, we're in that kind of an environment again, where uh, a policy is not uh, oriented towards maximizing economic growth and productivity growth. We're, we're shooting for other uh, objectives. And I think that uh, that in, in that environment, uh, we're going to see uh, a slowing economic growth, perhaps slowing productivity growth, uh, uh, and uh, higher uh, inflation and higher levels of real interest rates. Yeah, that's, okay. that's in, my in the, hunch. Okay. And the reason why I asked this question is, is, for somebody that is maybe projecting out their investing plan over the next couple of decades, and they're looking at the historic market returns over the past 40 years, right? They may want to consider sort of downshifting those future returns, the future average return in the market, because the economy may not grow as much as it did because we are prioritizing other things and maybe have this drag that we've talked about. Yeah. I, and I think the, uh, the, the, the concern that they probably should have most uh, is about uh, growth of corporate profits. We've had, uh, gosh, three decades of uh, growth in corporate profits exceeding uh, uh, per capita uh, GDP growth. Uh, that can't happen indefinitely. If it happened indefinitely, then all of the output of the economy would go to capital and labor wouldn't get anything. So of course you can't sustain uh, an increasing share of uh, economic output being provided to capital relative to labor forever. Eventually that's going to mean revert. And I think we're, 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 we're approaching that uh, inflection point if we're not already there. I mean, you can see corporate profit margins have declined recently, uh, but whether that's a, a part of this long-term secular uh, inflection point as I think it is, or it's just a you know cyclical uh, a blip re related to uh, uh, current policy is way too soon to to tell. But but I suspect that's the concern people ought to have. Higher level of uh, interest rates though is great for investors. Uh, so you know I don't I I I I would hesitate to draw a direct line from uh, 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 a more difficult economic environment to uh, a more difficult environment for saving and investing. Uh, 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 higher yields are just wonderful news for anybody that is accumulating capital, right? right? If you're if you're if you've got zero or negative interest rates, that's just horrible for people accumulating uh, uh, assets uh, uh, for um, future needs, uh, you know, retirement or otherwise. Uh, and so the rise in interest rates that we've already seen uh, is uh, has dra dramatically increased expected returns. Uh, for portfolios, so uh, really, if you're if you're uh, you know you know what sixty forty last year dropped sixteen percent. So you know if you look uh, on your if you're if you're nearing retirement and you look on your four hundred one k statement and you see that you lost sixteen percent of your wealth last year, uh, uh, that's disappointing, but uh, uh, maybe even frightening. Uh, but if you're, you know, 30 or 40 years old, or 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 hopefully there's some people even in their 20s that are beginning to uh, uh, accumulate assets, uh, uh, this is wonderful news. You're buying at much lower prices. You're getting much higher yields. Uh, that's all to the good. So uh, uh, um, uh, higher yields really are, are good for uh, savers and investors. Well, th this is a great point that you're making. Um, two, two, two important points, but one I, I really want to spend a, a minute on. Um, first one, though, is that th the salad days of the past couple of decades for corporations, probably unlikely to return to as good as they've had it, 
right? I mean, they had like the cheapest capital ever. They had globalization driving down wage costs. Um, they they just had kind of everything they could ever have dreamed for, right? Tax it, cuts. Tax cuts, yeah, all, all that stuff. And so that that's it's probably not going to be as good again. Um, and that that may mean that stocks don't grow as much as they do just based as a function of earnings growth going forward. Um, Particularly in but, the U.S., you know, this uh, this phenomenon is much more concentrated in the U.S. than it is in the rest of the world. OK, great. That, that, that's a great qualifier. Um, but your second point, which I think is really, really important, um, is, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a statement you don't have to agree with. But but the Fed basically declared war on savers and retirees, uh, or at least those living on a fixed income. Um, when it started embracing these super low interest rate policies, right? It was sort of a conscious choice to say, we're going to prioritize other things. And those are the folks we're going to be throwing under the bus with this policy. And um, th that that may be changing here. And, and that can be a really good thing, right? Because that, that those low interest rates caused a lot of asset bubble inflation that went to the already rich. It really exacerbated the wealth gap. We have massive unaffordability problem in this country, especially with the essentials of living like homes and cars and education and all that stuff that was exacerbated by those low interest rates. So finally, um, the younger generations, which are, have been very demoralized by that, now have a glimmer of hope here. I don't want to sell too much sunshine, but they have a glimmer of hope here where um, they can use one of the most powerful forces in investing now, which is compounding. That's right. right. They couldn't get that before. Right. You, your, your bank account, bank accounts, bank savings accounts still pay almost nothing. But like bank savings accounts were paying on average, I think, like 0.03 percent for much of the past you know, five plus years. Right. I mean, just giving you nothing on your savings. Right. You had to go out in the risk curve to try to get any type of return. Now there's an alternative. Now with T-bills, you know, paying five percent. Uh, if you're a retiree, you can all of a sudden sit in safety again and, and get a livable return if you've got enough savings based off of that. So, yes, I think that's really, really important. And later on in this conversation, I want to revisit. Um, you gave a just a, a brilliant, uh, very concise plan for building wealth over time with low risk. Um, and basically, that plan really depends on the power of compounding. Um Finally, that plan really has a good shot going forward. So we'll talk more about that near the end, but I'll let you respond here. But I, I do just want to really like underscore for people. Yes, there's a lot of pain this transition is going to create, but this is one of the beneficial parts coming out of it. If indeed we're going into a, a, a secular era now of, of higher rates um, that then allow compounding to happen. I, that's uh, very well said. I agree completely. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, look, moving on, you 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 talked about um the likelihood of a recession coming this year or next. Um, I guess let me just ask you, how how concerned are you about this recession in terms of its magnitude, in terms of its length? Um is is you know, in, in a lot of people's minds, they're well, I don't want to say a lot of people, but but we've gotten to the point where we're so used to the Fed stepping in to save us, you know, that we just had the pandemic where we shut down the global economy, but we had the shortest recession ever, right? Because the Fed and, and the legislatures stepped in to, you know, do everything they could to try to not have folks take the pain today. Now there's repercussions they, they we're taking now as a result. It, it, it was both predictable and widely predicted that they did too much and the result would be inflation. And now we have it. Right. So um, presumably that kind of ties their hands a little bit uh, to be able to do the same thing this time around if the Fed is really fully committed to trying to. to yes. Maybe and I could argue that, for a deeper and longer switch. Yes, that, that, that's very that's very true. And uh, I think it's important to explain a little bit uh, in in simple easy, uh, uh, straightforward terms, what that constraint is. Um, the constraint is interest cost on the debt. Um, there's, uh, we, we, with, with um, you know, our uh, debt 
uh, to GDP over 100% and growing, all right? I mean, you know, you just it's trillion dollar deficits for as far as uh, the eye can see. And this is not the, you know, forecast of, uh, you know, right-wing conspiracy theorists. This is what the CBO, you know, uh, uh, projects. This is uh, uh, what mainstream economists uh, project. We have, a, we have a debt problem and uh, the, the economy can't afford uh uh you know um uh, much more debt uh it can't afford the interest cost of two or three percent real interest rates on the debt we already have uh uh and so yeah we are kind of really in a bind where it's um it's the it's the fiscal uh, uh policy constraint is more binding than the monetary policy constraint Okay. Um, well, which which force wins out? The immovable object or the unstoppable force here, right? So if it comes down to we got to get inflation under control, but we can't raise rates any higher because we can't make our you know service our national debt, um, which one wins out? Uh, it's it's as I said, it's fiscal. In other words, the um, uh, you know, I, I I talk about the uh, debt ceiling farce that's going to occur this summer, and I do mean it's a farce because, um, you know, this is an argument about a, you know, technical budgeting rule that really is irrelevant and silly, uh, but there's a, a it, it substitutes for a real debate that isn't happening, and that real debate is how do we square uh we the people's demand for uh government uh, benefits uh with the we the people's aversion to paying the taxes that are the source uh of the funding for those government uh, uh benefits and that's a that's a political uh uh, uh resolution that needs to come and, and uh, sadly uh the, the our political uh, system uh, seems the incentive structure there seems to uh, prevent uh, even a public discussion of the subject, let alone moving towards some kind of solution. But but that will have to happen. Okay, and just to make sure I understand, when you say that will have to happen, you're, you're saying fiscal restraint, meaning we're going to have to start chopping other items off the budget and reduce our deficits. I, I, uh, you know, um, in my youth, I was a, 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 a strident um, libertarian, and you know, Anne Ran uh, groupie. Um, uh, uh, as I've uh, uh, matured and and uh experienced more of the world and uh, uh, uh had a longer life i've stopped um my attachment to what i think should happen it's just yep. the universe doesn't really care so i try to pay more attention to what likely will happen than yep. whether i want it to happen and and i think uh uh people in the US uh and it's true whether you're talking about uh, uh progressives or uh right-wing populists uh uh want uh greater social benefits uh and um uh, that we if that's what our, our if we the people want then we have to figure out how to pay for it uh, uh you know maybe the solution is to uh cut Social Security, you know, raise the age of Social Security, uh, provide a cap on benefits to wealthy people, right. increase payroll taxes, uh, be more stingy on Medicare, you know, roll back the Affordable Care Act, uh, 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 chop defense spending. And, you know, you can read in other places, you know, the difficult math of how getting to a balanced budget uh, uh, without raising taxes would be. I don't think there's a political uh, um, um, demand uh, uh, for that kind of uh, austerity 
uh, I, I just don't think that uh, anybody's going to, any political party is going to get elected and get power on that platform. So what I expect is that we're going to have to raise uh, revenue uh, to pay for the benefits that the uh, voters demand. And uh, my personal view there is that uh, that means a value added tax. If you look at how uh, our country compares to other countries in terms of uh, 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 government uh, spending and uh, revenues, we collect as much uh, in payroll taxes as most uh, all other countries. We don't have a problem not collecting enough payroll taxes. We also collect uh, as much income taxes as, or more than any other uh, country. And by the way, probably have about the most progressive income tax system you can get. You could make the rate structure more progressive, but I don't think you can collect more from uh, the, the the wealthy. Sure, you could try, but I, I just I think we're sort of tapped out there, uh, practically speaking. And so to fund uh, uh, the greater benefits that people want, uh, we have to have that third leg of the stool that uh, basically every European country has, which is a value added tax. And there's nothing, there's nothing evil or wrong about that. Uh, it probably does uh, uh, retard uh, uh, productivity growth and uh, economic growth, but uh, a consumption tax is much better from an incentive standpoint than either payroll taxes or income taxes. Income taxes make people not want to, you know, innovate and start new businesses, and uh, payroll taxes are just a straight up incentive not to work. Whereas in uh, consumption taxes, work all you want, uh, innovate all you want. Uh, uh, but when you go to spend your money on consumption, well, you got You got to pay some tax. So I think it's the least bad from an economic incentive point perspective, uh, a tax to raise the revenue necessary to, 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 to balance our budget. So I expect that'll happen, uh, but it's nowhere in the political conversation. It's it, it, it can, economists of right and left both uh, 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 recognize this is likely where we're headed, but politicians don't want to touch the subject. Sure, sure. Yeah, no politician wants to until they they they, they have to, right? And and um, I use this term of society that you know that it, people individually or, or as a group um, they can change their behavior one of two ways. They change their behavior one of two ways. Uh, by insight, where they say, okay, look, if I keep doing X, this is going to happen. So I should change my behavior today to avoid that future. The problem is we almost nobody does that. Uh, human nature being what it is, uh, we typically change by pain, which is we only change when the pain of continuing the status quo is higher than the pain of changing, right? And the classic example of this is the guy who doesn't change his diet until he has the heart attack, right? Um, so yeah, we'll my probably favorite. slam into this problem head on. And what I hear you saying is, is you know, as we get squeezed between fighting inflation, or if we get squeezed badly enough between fighting inflation and, hey, we're raising rates that are crippling our ability to service our debt, something's got to give. The next answer in the story is going to be, okay, well, we need to raise new funding via tax. Yep. But, but, but it will only be when we have the pain, we really feel the pain of being squeezed between those two forces that enough people will say, yeah, we got to do something. And that then gives DC the mandate that it needs to solve this somehow. And of course, they're highly likely just to say, okay, great, we'll just put more taxes on the table. Yeah, if um, if you want to put this in uh, terms of um, economic theory, uh, what we're talking about is the intersection of uh, MMT and the fiscal theory of the price level. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right, well, look, so... Um, uh, I, I think we kicked this question off uh, talking about recession. So, so how how significant, substantial, painful, et cetera, long do you think this recession that we are courting here uh, could be? I I think it's. Um... important to understand first of all I, 
I don't know. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't see the signs that this is going to be a particularly nasty recession of the sort that we had following the global financial crisis, okay. because you know the banking system is well capitalized. Uh, um, uh, individual balance sheets are as you know very very healthy as uh, many people continue to have stuffed away savings from all of that new money creation that was wired into their uh, bank accounts as our corporations uh the but the but you know it's a it's a different situation because this debt problem uh and this debt cycle is not uh 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 you know too much uh uh credit card debt or more or 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 auto loan debt or housing debt which is you know really toxic that was the global financial crisis it's not over levered corporations it's over levered sovereign uh borrowers uh uh, uh the US Europe uh, Japan uh China uh and um uh we, we, we we've got to we, we we've got to deal with that i i i don't think that it's um look uh, recessions happen they're part of the economy right it's just a question is how long do you go between them uh, just like uh stock market drawdowns happen you know uh, you know are we going to have a bear market well we are going to have a market you know how much are they well sometimes they drop 25 sometimes they drop 40 sometimes the market drops 50 percent that's going to happen the question is only with how much time is there to the next one um and so those are those are uh, just incredibly predictable recurring events that people shouldn't worry all that much about, but they should plan for, right? Like a, 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 a in economic theory, maybe you don't need to worry about this, but in practice, uh, people yeah. ought to have no oh, at least several months. You know, if you're if you're an hourly worker and and um, uh, if you're a well paid professional, a year or two of cash. Uh, uh, or very safe, uh, low risk investments uh, uh, to tide you through a difficult spot should you become unemployed. You know, what's the joke is uh, a recession is when somebody else loses their job, a, a depression is when you lose your job. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, now's probably not the time uh, uh, to go out and uh, 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 lease, a, you know, a new car that that stretches your ability to make your monthly payment uh, uh the the you know there there's you know some increased probability that some of us are going to lose our jobs and we probably want to be uh prepared for that uh, all right you're taking this right where i want to take it which is really sort of the human side of it right you know we can argue about the benefit of the cycles and all that stuff um but what really matters to the individual is yeah but what happens to me right um, and so you're, you're getting you're getting to a topic I want to talk about in just one second, which is sort of the, the layoff risk this time around. But I want to talk about policy just for one second, because you can make a pretty good argument that our policy has, you know, over the past couple of decades um, has has shifted to trying to control the the cycle and to try to to try to push off recession whenever possible and to try to lessen it whenever it happens. And in 08, you know, we had the TARP and TALF and all that stuff. Um, you know, those were to, to that was to, to bail out a system that was, you know, experiencing cascading failure at the time. Um, but really, I mean, we it, it really, you know, that, that got us to QE. And then we had all the different cute flavors of QE for the following decade, right? Um, and then in the pandemic, we had the biggest, you know, most unprecedented uh, intervention we've ever seen. One, one could be led to suspect that we will not have that type of aggressive um, intervention to try to lessen the pain of a recession this time around, in many cases, because the central planners whose role it was to largely do that, their hands are tied because of inflation this time around. Um, I... I, I, I'll, I'll take a different perspective uh, and say that in 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 crises, uh, we have central banks, and that is the uh, reason that we have central banks, and that the central banks uh, will continue, likely successfully, uh, to be the lender of last resort in in a crisis. 
Um, if you uh, uh, if our if our listeners want to learn more about this subject, there's a great little book, quick read called uh, 1907 that tells the story of what happened in the economy in the United States before we had central banks, and then you know in the in the decade or two that followed, uh, we created the entire you know 20th century uh, 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 financial architecture with the with the Fed and the the SEC and uh, uh, um, deposit insurance and all of that. So that, that we we need a lender of last resort. Uh, if we didn't have one, uh, the very next financial crisis would reveal the need for a lender of last resort, and we would create one. We don't have to because we have one and it's not going away. I know some of my libertarian friends think everything would be wonderful in the world if we could just abolish the Fed, all um, uh, uh, you know, manage our finances on the blockchain. Um, but uh, 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 the world needs a lender of last resort. The Fed is the lender of last resort. They will continue to be. I, I don't think that's going to change and people don't need to worry about that. The, 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 the issue is what's the what's the fallout what's the cost this 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 lender of last resort activity is not costless it's worth the costs uh uh, uh because otherwise you have the sort of incredibly deep and painful uh, uh recessions that um that we've managed to avoid with uh, with uh, very sensible concepts like bank regulation and and the lender of last resort and um, deposit insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think those basic crisis management tools are going to dissipate or, or go away. All right. Uh, so, uh, but they're, but, but they're, they're, they're costs. Right. You, you, can we, you continue answering, but let me ask you this. Like, should a recession in and of itself, should that be a crisis that a central bank should step in to, you know, play a role in, or really should the central bank be there for true systemic crises, like in 08 when the banking system was in the process of shutting down? Yeah, I think that's a, 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 a question well asked. Um, if a, a, a recession is uh, a real economy adjustment that needs to occur, uh, attempting to use um monetary policy to prevent it uh, is probably counterproductive uh, and costly you're you're actually causing a cost uh, to to with no benefit negative benefit um however uh even though the most so, so this gets to an interesting point which is the 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 most recent uh, uh, uh the, the the economic problem we're having now is mostly exogenous shocks what I mean by exogenous shocks means it's not internal to the capital markets. Right. Uh, if you look at the last, say, 30 years, almost all of our recessions have been uh, uh, endogenous, that 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 there was stuff going on, you know, developments inside of the capital markets that cause the real economy to go in recession. So you look at the um, um the Japanese, the implosion of the Japanese bubble uh, uh, in in uh, nineteen um, ninety. Uh, you look at the sovereign uh, debt crises, the EM. Uh, uh, we didn't call them emerging markets then. We, what did we call them? Lesser developed countries uh, 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 of of the nineties, and then. You know the uh, Asian financial crisis and the default of Russia as the as the as the late '90s, and then you had the implosion of the dot com bubble in 2000. Uh, we had the um, we had the global financial crisis uh, in 2007-8. Uh, then you had the European sovereign debt crisis in the in the years that followed. Um, those sorts of uh, problems, you, it's really important to have a lender of last resort. Uh, uh, and and, and you, we, we would, wouldn't, all of those uh, events probably would have caused deeper real economic contractions than were necessary, absent a lender of last resort and multilateral institutions. Um, however, um, this one, right? The pandemic wasn't wasn't you know too much debt uh, and a run on the bank. 
um, uh, 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 so this is this is very different, and it's it's important to understand that that uh, we've got a secular problem of uh, uh, we, well we have a you know a host of problems. One demography, uh, uh, and that's not really a problem because you can't prevent it. I, I mean, you could kill off all the old people, but I don't think that's a solution anybody wants. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, it's actually good news, right? We we, we you know medical technology means that we're all living much longer. And and we're having higher quality uh, lives into our age, but it it uh, uh, it puts upward pressure on 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 uh, wages and likely real interest rates and inflation as well. Uh, and uh, uh, we're prioritizing different things. We're prioritizing. Uh, uh, addressing climate change. We're prioritizing making our supply chains more resilient. Uh, we're prioritizing uh, uh, protectionism and 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 against immigration, which you know my my libertarian leanings and, and free market preferences uh, suggest that's not very healthy. But uh, again, it just it is what it is. Um, uh, you can't fix those kinds of problems with a monetary solution, right? Like printing money doesn't do anything to address those uh, real challenges. Uh, but uh, um, being a lender of last resort that can create unlimited quantities of money is, is really important when there's a run on the bank. You know, go back and look, you know, watch It's a Wonderful Life, right? I mean, that that's a great movie to teach everybody what a run on the bank looks like. Right. Um, and so uh, I guess the, the question I have, and then I, I do want to move on to get to how you're managing capital in this <laughs> environment, because I know a lot of people are very curious to hear that part, um, is, yeah, in a true systemic crisis, you want a circuit breaker, right? You, you want something there to, that stops the, the cascade, right? Yeah. Stops the run on the bank. Um, but if you're in a, I'm going to call it a, a relatively, you know, uh, garden mill you know, recession where there's nothing necessarily systemically breaking. Um, although some people think the Fed's hiking may actually cause something to systemically break. Um, uh, the question is, is, you know, should a central bank intervene then or should it let a natural recession, you know, the recession perform its natural function of cleaning out the malinvestment, right? And we've had a number of people in this program say that, you know, the Fed as flawed as it is, isn't completely blind. And uh, they realize there's a lot of excess in the system right now uh, that they probably have honestly would love to have had cleared out beforehand. And this gives them an opportunity to kind of let the cleansing fire, you know, take out a good chunk of the malinvestment um, as long as it's orderly, right? And so I've, I've, I've heard commentary recently on this channel that the Fed doesn't really care about the price of the stock market. It doesn't really care about the price of the housing market. Um, it just doesn't want them to melt down in such a way that it, it triggers something bad enough that it's got to get uh, involved in. And, and kind of the reason why I'm asking all this is, while we might not have a crisis like we had in 08, right, it may still feel like a pretty bad recession to the regular person because there's not a lot of, of um, you know, uh, helicopter parenting that the central planners are going to do this time that, that we've gotten used to them doing in the past. Yeah, so I agree with what you just said, although I would use slightly different words, and I'll try to be more concise this time. No, um, no, that's okay. Uh, unlike the uh, mm, uh, recessions that have been caused over the past uh, 30 years, which are almost all caused by financial crises, when, when I say financial crises, think run on the bank. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful life. When a financial crisis, crisis causes a recession, uh, it's very useful to have a lender of last resort to come in. The, the lender in last resort, of course, was uh, 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 um, Jimmy Stewart's brother who flies in from Europe and is rich and saves the day. But of course, you know, that the the Fed is now the you know rich brother that you know that that flies in and saves the day. Um, uh, when you have a financial crisis is the cause of a recession, it's great to have the ability to have a lender of last resort solve that problem. Um, this problem that we're facing today is not uh, uh, in dot endogenous to the capital markets. It's not a run on the, we don't have a run on the bank. We don't have a financial crisis. That's not the problem. So the, the Fed can't solve the problem that we have 
uh, uh, this time around. They can if it becomes a financial crisis, uh, uh, but it, 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 we don't look. The unemployment rates at three point four percent. People maybe think that five percent interest rates are really weird, but I mean, oh my gosh, uh, you know. When I bought my first house, I had double digit mortgage rates. Uh, and it didn't stop me from buying a house. Um, uh, uh, I don't think 5% interest rates are, are abnormal. It's only in the context of this very weird, you know, zero interest rate uh, fantasy land that we lived in for a while. And, and again, that was not all at, at the fault of the, uh, of, the, of the central banks. This was huge amount of labor coming into the system, China joining the global economy and not just China, but, you know, India and Indonesia and Africa. And uh, 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 so uh, 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 that was weird and it was unusual and it's coming to an end. Um, uh, so you're not you can't solve the the problem of uh, 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 rates rising back up to normal levels through printing money. You can't solve the problem of increased uh, support ratios. You know that 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 worker fewer workers are supporting more retirees. You can't solve that by printing up some you know lowering interest rates or quantitative easing. Um, uh, the, the, these are these are different sort of problems, and and that's the 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 event that caused the recession here uh, uh, is, is 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 an exogenous outside of the financial system so shock. So we're going to have to adjust. We're going to have to adjust to higher interest rates. We're going to have to adjust to greater support ratios, um, and and we're going to have to pay our bills. Got it. All right. And that's a fiscal um, adjustment. Fiscal, fiscal adjustment. <laughs> fiscal adjustment. Okay. Yeah. So basically, look, um, what, what you're sort of saying here is, is look, um, the cavalry is not coming. The 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 water in the Fed's hose isn't going to put out the type of fire that we're dealing with here. However, you want to say it. Um, but since since mommy and daddy aren't coming, we're going to have to fight this one by by putting on our big boy pants, tightening our belt, and figuring out how to just get through it on our own. Pay, um, pay your bills. Pardon me? We have to pay our bills. We have to pay our bills. We finally have to start learning to live within our means, perhaps. Yeah. Um, all right. So look, as I as I said in the introduction here, um, you manage a lot of capital um, and the research that your firm produces influences how a lot of capital gets managed. In this environment that we've been talking about for the past hour, um, how are you thinking through how you allocate capital in this type of environment? Um, we uh, are very transparent about that. Uh, if you were to go to our website and you could type into your browser researchaffiliates.com, or if you uh, prefer a, a shorter name, rallc.com, take you both to take you to the same place. Um, you'll find our research affiliates a website. Prominently featured on that website is something called tools. And uh, uh, the if you click asset allocation under tools, you'll find our asset allocation in, uh, our asset allocation interactive um, uh, web tool, which provides all of our uh, expected returns. It explains how we uh, calculate those expected returns. Uh, also uh, provides all sorts of interactive tools that allow you to form portfolios and examine the risk and and uh, expected return of various uh, different uh, uh, sorts of portfolios. It's a very rich and free tool uh, uh, that, that we provide. Um, in terms of long-term planning, uh, uh, the, the rising yields has increased the expected returns across the board. Um, uh, but we do have some uh, preferences. Uh, we prefer uh, international equities to U.S. equities. We prefer value uh, relative to uh, growth. Um, and we prefer more diversification to less diversification. Uh, let me uh, uh, highlight uh, some uh, of our expectations uh, that come from our uh, models, uh, all of which, again, is displayed uh, on our website. Um, now, 
bonds uh, now provide positive real uh, yields uh, relative to our 10-year inflation expectation of a bit above 3%. Uh, the US aggregate bond index now provides an approximate 5% nominal yield. Uh, and, and the expected return for bonds is basically equal to nominal uh, uh, yields for, for high quality bonds. Uh, high yield bonds, which now yield about 9%, uh, you have to take about 3% off for expected losses, average expected losses, but that's still a 6% uh, a nominal yield, uh, even after credit losses for, for, for high yield. Uh, now, Global equity markets have a much greater dispersion of returns because of the starting yields. Uh, starting yields are much higher outside of the U.S. than they are inside the U.S. Uh, we expect an annualized nominal uh, uh, return over the coming decade of about 5.5% for the S&P 500. 10% for EFA, uh, uh, you know, uh, developed uh, XUS. Uh, equity markets and 11 and a half percent for for emerging markets. And given the continued wide dispersion of the pricing of value stocks versus growth stocks, look, because they don't grow as fast, value stocks are always priced at a dif discount to growth stocks, but we're priced currently at a far wider discount than um, uh, uh, is normal is average over history. Now, yes, we had a great run for value last year, but that only took the froth off of the, 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 the bubble that occurred uh, post-pandemic. We're still back to the sort of valuation discrepancies that we came into uh, the pandemic with in 2019. So value mm -hmm. stocks are priced at substantial discounts and, 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 a, and a higher interest rate, higher inflation environment, I think is the kind of environment that does favor re-emergence of value as long-term outperformance uh, versus growth. So we see uh, a couple of percentage point uh, 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 additional incremental return to all of those numbers that I described for cap-weighted indices uh, for uh, uh, value strategies. So widely diversified, uh, uh, favor international over uh, uh, U.S. Uh, in a... In a uh, don't go crazy. I'm not saying put all of your money into emerging market equities, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know I might have an equal amount in uh, uh, U.S. equities, developed ex-U.S. Uh, equities, and emerging market equities. That would be very, very different from a traditional uh, uh, model portfolio that you would find uh, uh, across many advisor platforms. And I think it's going to provide higher uh, uh, accumulation of wealth uh, than concentrating just in the U.S. equity market as people have so successfully done over recent decades. All right. Um, that was fantastic. Thanks for sharing so much detail. Um, I will put up the links to your website uh, when we edit this. I'll overlay them so people know exactly where to go to get access to those free tools that you mentioned. That's a great resource. Um, let me just ask for clarification, Chris, what, what sort of timeline are you looking at when you when you look at that allocation? And, and let me tell you why I'm asking the question, which is um, <clears throat> if, if we expect that earnings may continue to come down this year for the reasons that we talked about, you know, recession, rising rates, you know, all that stuff, um, is how concerned are you that um, valuations just sort of in general across the board due to everything we talked about um, may come down this year? And, and, and therefore, there are some capital managers I've talked to who are more liquid today than normal simply because they expect in the next couple quarters there to be, you know, some material correction in the markets, especially as they've sort of the market narrative has sort of been fighting the fed the fed's been saying we're going to go higher for longer and the market's sort of been saying no we don't think you are <laughs> you know um so do you, do you have it is the outlook you just shared does that take into account dynamics that may happen in the next couple quarters around that factor i usually counsel uh individual investors and families to eschew uh market timing 
uh, it's very hard to get it right. You have to, you not only have to, you know, get the timing right on the exit, but you also have to get the timing right on the entry. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a large body of research uh, examining how people actually behave is they get the timing horribly wrong. Yep. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm hesitant to, to uh, do that. Now that that said, professionally we man we do active management, and we have a history of success in uh, in active management, uh, and we use the 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 sort of um, uh, tools and signals that uh, uh, people are well aware of. You have you know. Uh, um, short-term, you know, positive serial correlation of prices, otherwise called momentum, you know, over periods of months, things that have been going up continue to go up uh, until they don't. And then you have longer term uh, mean reversion, you know, a value signal over a period of years, uh, 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 you know, trees don't grow to the sky and you have mean reversion in the other direction. Um, uh, you overlay, uh, you know, those basic uh, sort of technical price patterns with, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, fundamental wisdom, uh, which, you know, goes under the rubric of quality. Generally speaking, unless you are really doing your deep research and homework, uh, you want to avoid uh, over levered companies. Um, and, uh, um, you know, you've got to pay attention to, uh, you know, special situations, uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions and spinoffs and whatnot. And all of that, uh, 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 you know, professionals can and do use those, uh, that, that information to create an edge. Uh, and then I'm sure uh, many, many individuals do as well, although the average individual doesn't, gets it wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. So mostly I'm talking about long-term uh, uh, strategic portfolio uh, positioning that you just see through and don't uh, uh, get caught up, uh, 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 you know, changing, you know, trading your personal account based upon talking heads that you see on the TV. Okay. And that's, that's wise counsel. Um, and, and by the way, and I'm going to do this in just a minute, that's why on this channel, you know, we recommend that most people work in the with a partnership of a professional financial advisor um, to to minimize getting jerked around by our own human emotions on any given day, right? <laughs> um, and, and also somebody who can do the active management when the time requires it and has the expertise to be able to do that and you know kind of keep you grounded through the whole process. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, look as we as we wrap up here, um, I did just want to. Return briefly to the um, the investing strategy that you shared last time, um, and you explained it so well. I'm going to try to summarize it very quickly. You tell me if I if I have or haven't. Um, but you said, look, for someone who's looking to build wealth over the long term, there's a relatively simple formula for doing that, um, and uh, you know it, you you can. You, you, you can do other things besides this, but if you do just this alone, your odds over the decades of amassing, you know, material wealth are pretty good. You said it was invest a third of your income each month, right, which takes a fair amount of discipline and commitment in itself. Um, diversify it across um, a portfolio of domestic and international stocks and bonds, real estate, like REITs, uh, commodities, and other assets. Then you said each month you revisit it and you put your monthly contribution into the asset that's down the most since the previous month. So you're basically, you know, buying at, at you're always ensuring you're buying an asset at a lower valuation than it was previously. And you said, do this until you retire <laughs> and then do it in reverse where you sell a monthly stake from the asset uh, where, where the, the portion you sell each month is, is being taken from the asset that went up the most in the past month. Um, did I get the formula right? Uh, yes, I think that's uh, uh, covered all the key principles. I would uh, uh, I would advise people that uh, don't allow uh, the arbitrary number of a third, uh, although it, I, I probably shouldn't say that's an arbitrary number. There's a lot of financial planners that uh, can help you figure out what's the right percentage, um, but, um, if if you can't manage a third today, don't 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 throw up your hands. You know, figure out what. Can, so this is a a very real practical piece of advice. Figure out what you can 
put away every month. You know, you 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 have a monthly budget. You know what your 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 rent is or your mortgage payment. You know how much you spend on food and what your car payment is. If you have a car payment, I buy you don't have a car payment. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, uh, set up an automatic transfer. Open a brokerage account if you don't have one. I mean, I mean, you should be maxing out your four hundred one k or your IRA if you're you know self employed. But beyond that, beyond maxing out your tax deferred uh, uh, savings vehicles, create a taxable brokerage account and figure out what you can afford to make as a monthly transfer and make it automatic. Set it. This is a really, really key kind of behavioral thing. Is set that automatic transfer. You can always reverse it, uh, but uh, but if you get into the habit of seeing a monthly transfer out of your checking account into your brokerage account, that's a great start. And then the way to increase that over time is when you get a raise, put you know. Uh, 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 a chunk of that raise, however much you can afford, half the raise, a third of the raise, whatever it is. But I, I think just start with something in terms of a monthly transfer and then gradually increase that as your income uh, uh, grows over the years. Um, and don't 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 despair if you're 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 not able to put, you know, a full third of your uh, uh, of your income. Okay, great point. Don't don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough here. Just get started. Um, you didn't say this, but I, I I'm guessing you would say too that over time, you know, feel free to get competitive with yourself, right? Oh, I was able to put in a third last month. Let me see if I can make it 40%, you know, this this next year, right? Yeah. All right, you're nodding as I'm saying all this. All and, right. And, well, and, yeah, yeah. And the idea of uh, each month putting in divert into your diversified portfolio equal weighted put into whatever has gone down yes um and so the reason why i wanted to conclude on this was to make sure folks that that didn't see the previous video got to hear this formula um but also to give you a chance to say is there anything that's sort of uh anything more to say about it given how things have evolved since we last talked and and i'm guessing you would say from what we said a few minutes ago that this formula probably just got a nice tailwind against it um, from some of these secular shifts that we're talking about here, where actually you can you can use that compounding miracle more to your advantage today than you could even you know when we talked six months ago. Yeah, just a reminder uh, for people that are accumulating wealth, prices going down is something to be celebrated. Yay! It my my retirement my accumulation of capital assets. Just went on sale, right? And then, and then, you know, time will be your your greatest asset there as those assets recover, and then you get to compound on top of that as well. That's right. They they yield high. They, when when prices go down, yields go up. When yields go up, you're compounding at a higher rate. Great. All right. Well, look, um, Chris, for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, as have I. Thank you so much again for coming back on. Um, where should they go? Should, should should they go to researchaffiliates.com uh, to follow you and your work? Oh yeah, if you uh, if uh, if you like what you see on our website, you can uh, create a, uh, a a username and uh, you can get on our uh, uh, email distribution list, and we'll send you our thoughts, whether in the form of short. Uh, um, easy to read articles, more dense uh peer-reviewed uh, journal articles and um uh you know short uh, video clips explaining uh, uh what's going on in the capital markets it's part of our mission is to uh, uh educate investors all right well um as as a company wealthy on that has a similar mission um very happy to, to know you guys are out there and i do just want to underscore for folks this really is a great um, gift that that we're all getting here. Um, Chris and his organization, as I said earlier, you know they influence over 150 billion uh, in assets. You're, you're you're getting the insights of of really one of the top institutional money managers in most cases for free. Um, hard hard to beat that. Um, all right. Well, Chris, look, as we wrap up here, I just want to bring um, some free resources available. Uh, make sure folks are some available of some resources that we, we have to offer here. Uh, the most time pressing one is that Wealthion's online conference is coming up in just a week and a half here. So if you haven't signed up for the conference yet, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference and register for it there. 
Um, if you, you've missed our early bird price discount, which was the lowest price we offered, but there is still a last chance to save discount if you sign up before the end of this coming weekend. So make sure you do that before the price rises to full price the week after. Um, and also, as I, as I said earlier, uh, so I won't go into my usual song and dance here, um, a lot of big macro factors to consider that um, Chris and I talked about here. And then in particular, you know, there's the human factor element. Most of the people watching this video have a real life. They have real jobs. It's hard to do active management. Um, and as Chris said, a lot of individuals are just bad at it for the way in which we are wired and we get influenced by our emotions. And every day there's new headlines screaming at us, which is why I highly recommend you work with a professional financial advisor who understands and takes into consideration all the issues uh, and topics that, that Chris talked about here. Um, can help put together a strategy for your portfolio and keep you grounded in executing upon it. If you have a great one who does that for you already, awesome, stick with them. If you don't or would like a second opinion from one who does, Feel free to talk to one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. Just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. They'll reach out to you. They'll schedule a free consultation. Doesn't cost you anything. No commitment to work with these guys. Just a public service that they offer. Um, and then in wrapping up here, if you've enjoyed having Chris on this program, would like to see him come back on again, please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And I really want to underscore the subscribing part because we are just a few hundred people away at the time of this filming of hitting 250,000 subscribers here on Wealthion. Our two-year anniversary comes up in a couple of weeks. I'd love to get to the quarter million point before we get to our birthday. All right, Chris, again, I can't thank you so much here. Thanks so much for coming on the program. I look forward to having you back on in a quarter or two to call an audible, uh, given where we are in the markets by then. Thanks. It was a pleasure. All right. Same here. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.